and have I have apologies from Penny and Amber. Would someone move that they be sustained, please? Thank you. Seconder. Put to the table. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Contrary, aye. carried. <coughs> we have the confirmation of the non-confidential amendments. The ordinary meeting of the 31st of May. You've all had the opportunity to peruse them. Would someone move accordingly? Thank you. And a second. I'll put that to the table. All in favour, please say aye. Contrary, carried. Uh, you have the action plan over the page. No comment. Come back to any uh, and the, the governance plan. Are there any matters arising from that non-confidential minutes? If not, we move on. I don't have uh, uh, anyone asking for a leave of absence, any acknowledgements and tributes, public input and petitions. We don't have any extraordinary business today, do we? No. No notices of motion. We have a, a note here from Amber, which... Uh, no, no, that's for you on the Oh, sorry. <coughs> and we come down to... <coughs> Reports, Chief of the Executive and Staff. Uh, we start with the information report. Consents Review Group Progress Report, 11 to 31. Who's going to talk to that one? Okay. Just to give you a, a um, quick summary of the first report, that's the Consent Review Group Progress Report. Um, that group has been convened. It has had two meetings. Um, suffice to say, there's been some very robust discussion at that, in, in that group. The key aspects that have been discussed is what a future consent would look like, whether it would be a new consent or a variation, and if we need one. That has been a discussion of that group. Um, We've also delved into AUD at length um, and conditions around that. And the other key issue that's been discussed is in regards to timelines in the consent and council complying with those. And um, if we had a new consent setting forward timelines, um, that group has been working to a terms of reference at our last WMC meeting, Amber requested that we add more context to the consent, uh, or, or in terms of the consent, to the front of the terms of reference, which we have done. Um, and that's the, con the, the context that was provided in the 2007 and 2009 consents. And subsequent to that, um, Dr. Bruce Duncan has asked for further context to be provided, that being in terms of the scientific basis of the work that the WTAG did and that has informed the options review process. Um, I have provided to all the members a, um, the words that Dr. Duncan has requested we include in the little slip that I've given to you. We, we have reviewed it and considered to be appropriate to be included in the terms of reference and therefore um, at this stage we'd like to include that in the terms of reference going forward. It would be placed within the beginning part and the background part of the terms of reference. If everyone could have a moment to read it uh, and just let me know whether you, you are so in agreement. So through the chair, if the WMC is in agreement, we'd add it to the terms of reference for the wastewater review group um, for, the, for the process that they're working through to inform what our consent's going to look like in the future. No objections to that? We need that formally? Yes. 
Uh, the only thing I have to, to comment on that is perhaps around the wording is directly relevant, not that they should be acknowledged and included. Um, <clears throat> it should probably just be um, uh, uh, provided for reference to the CRG and be used, oh, be used, sorry, provided and be used as reference for an each consent application. So making it a making it up to them the relevance of that information instead of um, making it stated that it's included in discussions. But it's only a minor change. Otherwise, I'm happy. Are you move? I'll move. So if you're amended waiting. Yep. Here's another one. Call up Richard and Kate and all those in favour for so on. Councillor Kerry. <coughs> Uh, through the chair, may I ask if there are any other questions regarding the consent review group? Through the chair, there's no questions, but um, this has got on um, the wastewater appendix two, um, the um, on 22 consent review group workshop Monday 30th, meet of the minutes of the consent review group workshop Monday the 30th of August 2018. We, we haven't got 30th of August yet, and you've got the minutes for it, so <laughs> I think. It, might have been it's supposed to be July. Come on. Page 22. Yes, that, that date will be incorrect and um, we'll update that. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Uh, just in, um, I, I'm not going to try to find a page or whether it's referred to in this, but there's been mention um, uh, in today's papers regarding timeframes for consents. Do we still believe we're gonna meet timeframes that, um, that we've been tasked with meeting along this process? So through the chair, one of the things that's always been ambitious from our consent is the timeframes. The consent review group talked about which applications would be lodged by our timeframe of 30th of December this year. We will, we're more than confident we'll be able to lodge a consent for the disinfection component for the consent by 30th of December. So that's for the clarifiers in the UV that will be lodged by 30th of December. The discussion at the consent review group was around the wider wetland and whether or not that would be able to be consented by the end of this year. We won't be able to do that. And that's because we don't know the location, we don't know distances, we don't have enough detail to be able to lodge that consent. So until we have the detail of that, we won't be able to lodge that component of it. So. That needed to be clarified at the consent review group, and I'm sure we'll be discussing it at the next meeting as well, around that, that being the consent holder's intention. Supplementary then. So um, we'll be able to put in the, the consents for the, uh, for the actual plant that we're putting in, um, in stage one. We won't be able to put in consents for future stages, but we'll we'd be able to um, put in the variation to the existing consent. So through the chair, that's exactly the case. We'll be able to do the disinfection stage. The future stage, and that's part of the consent review group's uh, mandate that you've given them, is to look at what variations we would do as part of the consent application when we put it in. And one of the things that this review highlights is it's not starting with a new consent. All parties around the table are quite strong around, actually, it's very the, cons the existing consent. And I know the WMC had discussed that at the last uh, meeting as well. So to vary the existing consent to install the disinfection stage, but then also look at not only the current consent conditions and where <coughs> they are, there are some things in there that we would like to, to cover off as the consent holder. Um, and then looking at what components of the consent can be put in place to further enable the stage two components as well as part of that consent. So putting in some of the parameters around for AUD and making sure that some of the clauses that are there that would be superseded by our review survive and carry forward. And that's particularly where the consent review group's quite keen to make sure that the AUD component is still very alive in the consent and then making sure that the parameters that follow out from that, so that's clauses 40 to 62, I think it is, they need to be make sure that they are still kept relevant in any new consent going forward. So just to be clear, what we're doing is um, essentially establishing the clarification and uh, UV treatment under the existing consent, because it's already part of our existing um, requirement, 
and the uh, and we will be creating a consent that will be a variation on the consent that will likely be after December this year uh, because it's a slightly ambitious time frame. So for the wetland would be a completely different consent to the current one that we have for Bank Street because the location will be different for the wetland, for the discharges, all of those things will be completely separate. So 100% Councillor Dowsing, it's for the works on the Bank Street site that fit within the current consent conditions that we have now for disinfection. Anything to do with wetlands, there's not sufficient detail to be able to draft up a consent because we don't know any of the, the basic parameters that we'd need for a wetland to be consented at this time. Sorry, I know I'm going over the same, within the same horse, but um, I just wanted to uh, um, clarify that a little bit because essentially we didn't necessarily have that detail in the current consent in terms of what um, treatment processes might be incorporated for clarification and um, I think UV was mentioned specifically, but not clarification. So we were able to get a consent based on the theory of what was required. Um, would that not still be the case with uh, wetlands? Is that we, as long as we um, know what we're trying to achieve, the consent can be processed without the detail of specific resource consent for specific location, et cetera, et cetera. So through the chair, the distinction between the two is that the UV and clarification is within the existing consent limits that are already there. So there's a whole lot of consent limits in the consent that UV will enable. So the technology is on the same site using the same disposal outcome and the parameters that it has to meet are already defined within the current consent. For a wetland, it's a completely new consent because of we don't know where it will be. We don't know what it will be discharging into. We don't know the rates. We don't know enough detail to be able to get a physical resource consent to go away and build it. So we're at the stage in the consent where we have something that enables the future work to carry on, but it wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do a consent condition up now with so many unknowns that would mean that we go from where we are to turning it on without needing another brand new consent for it. So with all of the unknowns, we would it wouldn't be a good use of our money and investment to spend that at this at that time because there's just too many things that would change through a subsequent resource consent. November meeting, are you and Wolf to bring us right up to speed before you put that application in for the deadline for 18th of December? So through the chair, absolutely, and that, that would be the intent of what we're working to is how much of the resource consent it will be pretty close by then. By the November meeting, we'll be talking about Section 42 reports and those kind of things. So that would be one that we'll be able to update on for that, for that meeting. Or October, we can meet as well. <laughs> um, just, um, just on that, if we, when we, what would you envisage the timelines would be on getting a new consent for the wetland and the process of um, obtaining the right land and that, well, that whole discussion. I mean, we've, we've been through some scenarios, but um, you know, we need to really nail us and um, give some um, some evidence that you know there is going to be a consent for the wetland process down the track. So, what kind of timelines are you looking for that? And the current consent that we'll be putting forward is around the proposal that it was adopted in the long-term plan. So once an option becomes feasible, we would then look at how that would be constructed, where consenting timeframes. So from purchase of land, we take that, then move forward to the consenting stage. For a, a project of this type, the consent development would take around 12 months to be able to get the necessary information to then lodge. And then the process could take anywhere from nine, six to nine months, and depending on whether or not we end up being able to get it through a commissioner or if it has to go to environment court or what happens. So it's a long process because of the volume of information that needs to be collected on the impacts for the site where it goes into. We know the parameters from all of the work that we've done around what water quality looks like, but it's going to be, well, what effect would that have on an environment around um, things like smell, odor, um, so odor sorry, noise, um, if we were going to be in putting it into a water, what effect that would have on a waterway, what effect it would have on fish life, all of those things we have in theory, they now have to be proven to be site specific and for the waterway or the land that it would be discharged into. 
that there would have to be work through in that next level of detail, and that would take us time to, to finalise. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is the, a, a progress report on the independent review panel. Um, as requested um, by the WMC to commence. The independent review panel has had a site visit to familiarize themselves with um, Gisborne and uh, the wastewater treatment plant and the general surrounds. Um, they've had a first meeting. And from that meeting, we have gone through their terms of reference and are in the process of providing them with all of the information We've given them a first tranche of information uh, that they are reviewing, and they are about to request further information. It is an evidence-based review, so our job at council is to provide them with the, the, the information so they can do the review. They have um, also visited Gisborne and interviewed various people, for example, the WMC and EB representatives. Um, to help inform their, their review. And uh, they are working towards having their report ready for the 18th of October WMC meeting, which then also coincides with an update on the consent review group um, meeting, as well as the internal compliance review we are doing. So we can have a holistic view of, of all issues at that meeting on the 18th of October. Um, thank you. So th through the chair, um, we initiated an internal consent review process that's looking at the entire consent um, that the CRG, the consent review group, is looking at um, with a view to establishing whether we are complying with all the conditions of the consent. Um, we have had um, compliance reviews in the past. Most of those have focused on the operational requirements. Um, but this compliance review includes all of the less op operational compliance requirements, such as the AED components um, of the consent. Um, the council staff are looking primarily at the operational requirements, and they are being informed by the review done by the IRP in terms of those less operational requirements. Um, and that, that's been done because we don't want to double up, and we're having an independent review anyway of a whole lot of um, conditions. So they're happening as parallel processes, and um, both of those reviews will be done in time for the October meeting, at which, excuse me, at which stage um, we'll then have a complete view of our compliance. Um, council will only have received the independent review panel um, outcomes on that date, so we won't have had a chance to review what they have said, and we will be taking their recommendations and opinions and um, integrating them after that into that comprehensive holistic compliance review. This is essentially us running a review in parallel with the independent review. Um, I assume the outcome is to ensure that um, we uh, agree with the findings of the other review panel, of the independent review panel, and that it, it informs our 
consent variation or consent process in the future? Is that essentially what this is about? So through the chair, the point of the internal review is to respond to a request from WMC around have we been keeping in with our consent and showing our performance over the life of the consent from a very technical basis. So this will be have we breached certain parameters of the chemical compounds, blah, 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 in the consent. The IRP will give us a list of recommendations. I suppose what we're flagging is that the IRP will have just given us their findings, which we will present to you. We won't have our response or what things we will then subsequently change based on that. That would have to be the following meeting because we will have just received it. So we'll be giving it to the committee what's and all alongside our track record of compliance um, to show where we have breached um, and then what things we'll put in place as a, as a result of those breaches to make sure that so. Um, that will happen at, this, at the same time, so you can see the high level and the low level detail as well. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, Ian Rue was going to be here with me today to talk about the Mori Compass. Um, he's got some very important uh, Mahaki um, proceedings on the go, and so he's excused himself. So we don't have a presentation today. Um, I can, I ever give you a very short update on progress um, on the Compass. So whilst the Mori Compass, the, the high level concepts and principles have all been worked out and have been applied, Council has been working together with Ian to look at the, the practical implementation of some of the, 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 the tool. Um, and uh, we, we've been running a collaborative process with him, with, with a number of GDC staff to make sure that the tool is also fit for purpose for use by Council. One of the key aspects we're looking at is the use of the tool in consenting processes, which is of particular use to Council. And that is to be able to use it to demonstrate change and, and, and how mitigation efforts affect Modi. Um, and we've made some really good progress there. Um, not quite there yet, but, but close. Um, and um, yeah, we continue to work together with Ian and hoping to very soon have an off the shelf product that is ready there um, to be used in, uh, as a completed tool. The Compass will be a tool that the Council can use um, to, to assess changes in Modi. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's why we are looking at working together with Ian so we understand the fully and can implement it if we choose to. It, it seems like we're generating some really unique and interesting IP in this. Is it something that we'll be looking to share with other Councils once we've um, established the protocol around how to implement it or how to apply it to projects? Or is it something that we're um, primarily focusing in-house use with at the moment? Oh, you. <laughs> so through the chair, the Modi Compass, absolutely, we've been talking with other councils and Ministry for the Environment about what it is that we've been creating. Um, we haven't kept a any license for it or anything like that. Um, it's not something we as a local government would use as an IP to sell, we can't. Um, on a, so it is something that we have been sharing with a lot of our colleagues around the country and there has been interest. There are a number of Modi assessment tools um, that different hapu and iwi across the country have been using. Um, and the same is said for us here in Tairawhiti as well with different hapu wanting to assess Modi in their own way. It definitely has been a tool that some have used and seen the merits of, and then there are other mm. um, different tools which Hapu have come to us and said, for us, this is our way of doing it. So it's working with Hapu to see where they're, comf where they're comfortable and what, whether they want to use the tool or not going forward. So um, it's been tested with our staff at Tarakahu. Is, is that in progress at the moment? And um, has there been any um, uh, beneficial results from it? So we've, we've been to site, we've done the, the fieldwork components, 
and we've then compared the, the, that data to the, uh, the text or fill out the text component. And, and then through that process, we've we identified this need to show change and to be able to use it in the process, which is why we are now extending the time frame out a little bit. And we are able to get a snapshot of Modi, but what we're really focusing on is how do we use it to demonstrate change? What if we did this? How would it change the Modi? And, and that requires some practical implementation changes to the spreadsheets and so on to, to show that. Because we, we want to be able to say, if we do this at Powakahu, how will it change the Modi? And to show the quantum of change in the tool. So it's really a nuts and bolts sort of discussion at the moment. I know, I know it's nothing to do with this body of the committee, but in terms of our freshwater plan going forward, have you had a look at how Murray Compass applies to that? We're, we're definitely looking at Murray in, in terms of the freshwater plan. So under the freshwater plan, Modi is one of the um, parameters that needs to be assessed for resource consents for some significant water bodies. And it's one of the key components that sits within. How Modi is assessed is up to the mana whenua for them to decide how Modi is assessed for the water or the water bodies. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just wanted to comment. So part of the uh, Modi compass uh, aspect of it is actually kama whenua and their practices. So there would be an area where um, only, I guess, individually even the council staff could potentially manage. Yeah, it's quite a generic one. You can, no, you know, yeah, no, you're right. You can apply to a human. My point was, if it's a successful here, and the pony here adopts it, it's there for wider use, as long as Ian doesn't object too much. No, I'm sure he won't. No further questions? If not, would someone move the recommendation? Thank you, second. I put that to the table. All in favour, please say aye. Fifty-five. You're the star today. Uh, huh? Yeah. Okay. So moving on to page fifty-five. Um, so that's the an annual report which covers the last financial year covers various aspects. Um, first one is the operational compliance. And uh, as you know, we are running a parallel process now um, to, to um, check up on our compliance. Um, the information is showing if we are meeting all requirements in, in terms of the technical aspects. There is one technical aspect where we've had some strange results and that's with the whole effluent toxicity testing um, but we're working with the, the lab that does the test to figure out what's going on there. Uh, we were complying, all of a sudden we aren't um, in one of the tests and we've, we've asked them to retest it and unfortunately there have been some lab issues. And so um, we've missed the summer period to retest it and we'll be retesting it next summer. Um, Apart from that, in terms of the technical aspects, we're, we've got a clean bill of health. Um, if you have, I suggest that if you have questions related to any of the specific aspects, we deal with it as we go through. So are there any questions on that part, the operational compliance? The only question I had actually was about the mortuary waste and the, um, and there's a, 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 a treatment process mentioned in there and I hadn't heard of it before. Um, I didn't think there was any detail around it. Are you may um, may no, I, I will be getting to mortuary waste in a few minutes. Um, if we we'll maybe deal with it when we, when we get to it. Yep. Just if, if anyone has any questions about operational compliance right now, can we deal with those? I was just have a question about the um, whole effluent toxicity, toxicity um, testing. So is that down the track or is that part of, right? <laughs> when you're on the computer, you've got to the page you want to get to, but <laughs> you've got to go back to the... It, it, that's, uh, the that is something that's in the current consent. So that, that's coming, down, coming after. So through the chair, we can't do that test again until summer period. Yeah. So we wait until then, but it is on the 
we will go back and retest in summer. There's no point doing it now. There's too much water in the system. So right. go back in summer, low flow period. That's when we do it again then. Is it, so is it, we've well, got it booked in to redo again. Okay. Well, there's something of concern. I mean, um, was it a, a fault at the laboratory um, or um, you know, because the way you read this, it, um, it seems like there wasn't too much of a problem to start with, but at the end, uh, and they said that's because of the high, um, yeah, the high. Um, yeah, the, the, there are three tests that are carried out. Um, one passed, one failed, and one had a lab issue. So that's a, a processing issue at the laboratory. We then sent them a whole new suite of tests, of, of samples, yeah. to test, and we had um, similar issues again. And so now we're working together with them and, and the regulator. We've kept the regulator informed um, on, on making sure we iron those out. And then we'll do the next test in summer when there's low flows, when it's the most toxic, I guess, right. um, to make sure we're getting the right test. So it wasn't anything that would um, ring alarm bells or anything um, as a procedure? Yes, and uh, the failure was, uh, the, that first failure was only slightly over. Yeah. And um, so it, it wouldn't have, we wouldn't anticipate any significant issues as a result. Yeah, that's quite cool. Yeah, that's good. Way outside the boundaries of the way that's just the way I guess the only question around that is that um, just over is still over, obviously. <laughs> Um, is there any is there any um, improvements we can make in the existing plant to, or, or is it um, or will it simply be, well, if we're slightly over, fortunately we've got additional treatment coming in that will correct it anyway. So through the chair, the treatment process we believe is fine. We've never had a problem with this before. So we think it's more the test that put us over rather than the plant. Why we want to reconfirm is exactly as you're saying, councillor, is to be able to say if there's an issue, what's going to be the mitigation for that. The clarifier and the UV will help in this space for sure. Um, but it is one we need to be compliant now, hence why we want to go back and check the tests as soon as we can. So if I may then move on to the next item in the annual report. Um, so we were requested to provide a timeline of decisions and milestones in the uh, wastewater treatment plant upgrade. So that's the, the wastewater management options project, which we provided. Um, that's simply a timeline of decisions and milestones. If there are any questions about that, fire away. Otherwise, we can move on to the next one. Um, looking at the Tikaraka wastewater upgrade, um, we haven't done a lot of on that in the last year, apart from some preliminary scoping work, and that's because we've been focusing on the wastewater treatment plant upgrade at Bank Street. Um, but just to reiterate, we, through that scoping process, we looked at a three, through earth process um, comprising a wetland, um, and uh, we have included a budget for that in the LTP in, from the years uh, 2022 to 2026 um, to implement that upgrade. And we, we, we'd be working together with various stakeholders and making sure it's fit for purpose. There's more, there's more. So the, the, there's four items left to quickly. The Maori Compass, I think we've covered. Um, the Kiwa Group, so that's the Turanganui Akiwa Water Quality Enhancement Project. Um, that has focused on wider water quality issues in the bay. Um, and because the, the issues relate to the the wastewater treatment plant upgrade have been pretty much left to WMC and, and other processes. Um, that group is, is, their work is ongoing. And um, in, in, in the report, you'll see what aspects they're working on. We are looking to convene a meeting to look at what work they're doing and see what specific aspects we need to focus on over the next, next year. This is not really a 
too many questions, but it is a general water quality in the bay question. <laughs> so you may, may not be able to answer, but I always wonder what the, um, the heavy foam is that accumulates on the beach in the, in the, um, around Waikanae Midway. It's the, you know, it looks like sea foam, but it, it stays there. It's got a dense brown sea foam. <laughs> Thank you for your question, Councillor Dowsing. <laughs> it is not anything to do with the wastewater outfall. So we've had um, concerns around it raised previously. Um, and I know Lois Easton knows this in a lot of detail from the work. So we had issues about three years ago where we whipped straight out when there was a large accumulation there um, and got it tested. It ended up being um, algae, which was mixing with the high salt coming from a southerly flow, which then makes that foam a lot denser than normal. Um, the brown colour is the algae that's coming off it. So that's what we see at um, Midway. A lot of that comes out of the Waipawa and mixes in with the Tūranganui Akiwa River. And that's what we get when we get those flows through. Thank you, Dave. That's something new for me to learn. <laughs> Not yet. Um, so moving on to more tree waste. Um, this is an aspect that we have in included in the discussions of the consent review group to see if and how we would include that in a future consent for the wastewater treatment plant upgrade and, and, and associated. Um, Councillor Dowsing, you did ask about the different treatment method. That's a Wisconsin mound. Um, they are used for these sort of applications, particularly in North America, I believe. And um, it's basically a, a soaker wave field in the elevated mound onto which you put the mortuary byproduct leachate. Um, a report was done into that by Murray Palmer. And um, I guess that is an aspect that we'd explore further to see if that becomes the final solution. Um, if I could, uh, uh, th this is one that's particularly relevant to um, to Iwi and I'm sure to um, the wider community. And I, I'd like to think that it's something that we can actually move up the ladder of importance because it's it, it really goes against so so much so much that's important to us to be allowing this process to continue. So. Um, I appreciate that there's been investigations and we're looking into things, but I guess of, of anything that's happening in terms of um, outfalls into is this this is the most abhorrent. So I'd like to think that we could give this re really needs to be going up towards the, 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 the top of the list of, of things that we're dealing with because um, yeah, I just can't stress it strongly enough that it's 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 abhorrent. To, to Iwi and, like I say, to probably a, a large part of the rest of our community that um, this is continuing. Thank you, Leroy. So just to update the committee, as part of our recommendations for the consent variation, we would be looking to include something to manage mortuary waste better as part of that, as part of that consent that we would lodge by December of this year. Um, as Leroy said, Tangata Whenua have been very strong through the consent review process and through this whole process around the removal of mortuary waste. So very much see the, the need for, for progressing that work as soon as possible. Uh, perhaps a paper on, um, on treatment types for mortuary waste might be appropriate uh, in the future, just so that we have a, an outline of, um, of what may be suitable and, and what, um, what we may suggest could be suitable um, of those options. So we have to, you know, some, some guidance there. So through the chair, we provided a report previously to WMC about two years ago, the one that Wolf was referring to that Murray Palmer wrote. We canvassed a range of options looking around the world at what was used. When we met with um, Trotec at the time to discuss, the Wisconsin Mound was seen as the most um, viable option for us as a community. The Wisconsin Mound is, as Wolf said, a through earth disposal. We identified Tarahiri Cemetery as being the most viable option for that going forward. Wisconsin Mound is a septic tank that sits above the ground, basically. So it still has storage chambers, yet the 
material is able to go back through Earth through a soakage field, which just happens to be above ground. There's actually a number of them in operation out on the Poverty Bay Flats currently um, for houses that have very high water tables underneath them. So it's a technology that we think will work for what it is that we're after. I'm happy to bring that report back to WMC at the October meeting for you to see just to refresh of where that is and update on how that would look to work in with what we're proposing. Yeah, thank you. We've had a slight membership change and obviously I've joined the committee prior to that report, so um, I'd certainly appreciate it personally anyway. So alternate use and disposal. So we, we did do um, further work on that at the beginning of the financial year. However, we, we haven't continued those investigations while we've been doing the um, optioneering, final optioneering, and running the um, option through the LTP process. Um, we're now in a new financial year and we're looking to um, spend the budget that we have in the LTP to do those further investigations. And it is something that we are looking at as part of the consent review group, also looking at what we do um, moving forward. Is there through, is there anywhere in New Zealand use of wastewater? Is there any other council? Y yes, um, Mr. Chair. Um, for example, Taupo, they irrigate, cut and bale their wastewater. But they have very different conditions to here. Um, yep. Well, yeah, just a question to Matt Young. Do you think the budget that we've allocated in our LTP is going to be sufficient to be able to, um, to do this um, at the important level that it is um, going to be required? Because I mean, we've allocated 50 grand a year, and um, there has been questions asked whether that actually is going to be enough to be able to really delve into this whole situation. And um, one, we need to know the basic quality of water we got, we're dealing with to start with before we know what the application could be as well. So, um, you know, and all we're going to need is a drought. And um, that question is going to be huge um, about um, the possibilities of that reuse. Through the chair, the $50,000 that was allocated through the long-term plan is seed funding for us to then look how we can leverage that once we identify options and find alternative funding sources to investigate things. By alternative funding sources, the 50,000 helps us look for markets and then develop those up with individuals or companies that are looking to use that water for different aspects. So we are comfortable the $50,000 is what we need to be able to start the investigations and then we will look for more appropriate funding sources where they should be. Some of those may well be the companies that are interested in using the water will also invest in the use of that water as well. So. Um, yeah, it, it, it appears this is continuing to be a bit of a sticking point. Yeah. And one of the um, options that is maybe worth considering is that here we are obviously pushing this very hard. We're, we're, we're wanting to deal with it. So the opportunity and we've got proven capacity on, on working on projects like this is that um, maybe some sort of a partnership if necessary, but, um, but within we there's um, a definite appetite for us to be pursuing this, um, whether there's already, um, that this work's already been allocated, but uh, I'd like to think that we, the opportunity is at least considered for us to um, do some work on this alternative use and disposal. Um, we've identified that some of the um, options for, and, and sites uh, sit within iwi, um, so I just think rather than, again, we continue to put it in the too hard, too expensive basket, that um, in the spirit of partnership, um, we may be able to progress this um, a bit more effectively um, through our avenue rather than um, continuing to throw it back to council and, um, and their avenues. Very good offer from Ewe. I'm sure David listened carefully to that offer. No further questions? Um, in terms of that, yeah, mine was really going to be around the makeup of that um, 
uh, alternative use uh, panel who was who were going to be investigating. Um, and you've, I think you've just indicated that, that as seed funding, it, it still hasn't been decided as to the makeup of that panel. Um, so yeah, absolutely support the, the inclusion of iwi and, and hopefully um, some match funding and, um, and potential there. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to know is, would there be an opportunity for members of this group to be involved? Because um, I, I personally um, would love to be involved in it. Um, particularly seeing, you know, I, I have spent a great deal of time researching it personally, just because it's, uh, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> um, and the other thing was, um, oh no, it's on a different topic. That's a, yeah, just whether we'll be able to participate um, from the staff or. I'm sure David and Wolf will give you that opportunity. Okay. No more questions? No more questions. How's our overall budget look? Or should I direct that to David? In what regard? Sorry, Chair. <laughs> overall, we're tracking to, as we said we would for this financial year, we're within budget for what we're tracking to as well. Good to hear. Nothing further? Close our meeting hands. Amen. Meeting closed. Thank you for your attendance.